Hi everyone and welcome to Behind the Numbers. I'm Dave Bookbinder. I'm a managing director at B. Riley Advisory Services and I'm also the author of the new ROI, Return on Individuals. And welcome to the show where we dig deeper to understand what matters most in business. Uh, if you're watching this, you'll see I've got a guy sitting next to me. It's been a while since we've had somebody in the studio and I'm pleased to welcome this guy. His name is Mike McHale and he's the CEO of Production Systems Automation. Mike, welcome to Behind the Numbers. Thanks, Dave. Thanks for having me. It's my pleasure. Great to have you here in, live and in person. I know. Tell the audience who you are and what you do. So uh, I'm the CEO of uh, Production Systems Automation. Uh, we, uh, we're in the automation and robotics space. We have three divisions. Uh, our first division is uh, robotics and automation. Our second division is Department of Defense, where we're, we're uh, part of the hybrid projectile project and have a, a UAV program. What's a UAV, Mike? Um, you know, a drone. You a drone, okay. You break it down okay. to a drone. And then our, our third division is SMT, which is surface mount technology. So we're, we're introducing products for board, underboard support for actually making circuit boards. Gotcha. Why don't we start by talking about the difference, if there is one, between robotics and automation. Is there a difference between them or are they synonymous? I, you know, in our world, um, they're kind of synonymous. Um, automation could be custom equipment. We add robots into custom equipment. But I think automation as a whole is more about augmented reality, AI, other automations that are around mm -hmm. us today. Yeah, you know, this morning, you go to the convenient mart, you check yourself out, that's automation. Okay. Uh, robotics is more, you know, a robot, people know of a robot, um, you know, doing packaging. Maybe right now you're seeing them in kitchens making pizza. Uh, that's more robotics. Gotcha. What industries are you working most closely with? Yeah, PSA, we're pretty much in most industries, uh, food and beverage, warehousing, fulfillment, um, heavy manufacturing. Uh, we kind of go through the gamut. You know, we're, we're a custom automation facility, so we design everything special to that client. We, we don't have a product line. Um, everything is for that particular application. Yeah. Help us understand what kinds of tasks are being done when we think about either robotics or automation. You, you mentioned a couple, but what, what are some of the things that, you know, there are obvious ones and maybe some of the less obvious ones? Yeah, I think, you know, for automation, the, the the, the jobs that we're finding are very re repetitive, um, picking up heavy objects, uh, doing, th doing activities that are kind of hard or stressful on the human body. 50 pound bags, 50 pound boxes, um, high speed repetitive picking and placing, which is difficult for employees. Or also we're putting robot robotics into spaces that are um, maybe climate challenged, 32 degrees or less, very difficult for a human to work in. Um, so th there are a lot of the applications we're seeing right now. Yeah, what about in the medical world? I mean, see commercials there, all the time for robotics in, in medical there's applications. A, there's a, a, a very big um, robotic push in, into the medical. You know, we're not necessarily in that space. We're in the automation space for doing uh, machines for the medical industry, but not actually in robots in surgery. But that, that space is growing. You know, I, I have an artificial hip, and my hip was, was put in by, by a robot. So, you know, I, I'm my... Uh, I'm a, I'm a fan. I think it makes uh, it's going to make surgery and recovery much faster. Yeah, that, that's what I hear also. Um, are there industries that maybe currently aren't using robotics and automation quite so much that are really ripe for that as an opportunity? I think one of the, the biggest uh, spaces that we see right now is, um, believe it or not, bakeries. Um, as the workforce is, as the workforce has become ch more challenging and labor rates have increased, um, the, the low skilled and the lower paying employees are now at the point where they're costing as much as what the automation could be. So we're seeing a lot of push into, into bakeries, novelties, and um, th th mostly in a lot of places that, that we would have never been able to automate those five years ago. The ROI um, would never be there because the employees were just uh, you know, too underpaid. Now that the pay rates are starting to increase, uh, we're starting to see a lot more opportunity. Yeah, let, let's talk a little bit about the ROI. I, I can imagine that you're generating a great uh, opportunity for companies to really improve their bottom line. Yes, uh, you know, we, we've, we'll look at projects that have a three month ROI. Um, we probably have never done a project uh, in the last five years that was over two and a half, maybe three years at max. Um, we have done a couple projects that were really insurance related, um, very bad environments, hot forging applications that were maybe not necessarily an ROI on, on, a, on, a, 
a person-to-person -person basis, but more on insurance and just work safety uh, of, of, a, of a human. Yeah. Um, can we talk a little bit about drones? Sure. Uh, it, it occurred to me that, that drones are pretty much everywhere. You see them flying around over uh, traffic incidents. You see them doing weather. Where, where are drones being utilized? Obviously, military operations. Where are drones being utilized currently, and, and where are drones headed in the future? I think you're going to see drones, well, obviously, you know, Amazon is testing out drones, dropping packages off at your house. Uh, you're seeing um, in hospital environments, you know, delivering blood or organs into remote areas. You're seeing uh, that done in, in Africa. That's going to keep on growing. You know, there, there's going to be a, a, a challenge on security and networking, um, but you know, we'll overcome that uh, over the next, uh, you know, I'm going to say decade. You know, I, I think we're going to see Amazon dropping off packages in 10 years to most houses. I think so. I, I, I believe so, yeah. So obviously there's a degree of accuracy and precision that has to be baked into any of these automation activities. And, and security. Yeah, talk about the security piece. You know, it's really, it's, it's remote comms. You know, how to make sure that drone's in the air and somebody can't take that drone over and steal your TV or steal that device that it's delivering. Um, you know, that's, that's an important part. I'm struggling to envision a scenario where I look out my window and I see a drone flying by with a TV dropping maybe, it off maybe, down the street. Maybe it won't be a TV, but it'll be uh, you know a smaller package. Even a box. I mean, yeah. that, that's just mind blowing. That's, it kind of is. It's kind of yeah. Jetsons yeah. stuff for those have, who remember the Jetsons. You can have your Apple Watch or your iPhone delivered to your house by drone. That's an interesting thought. That is crazy, Mike. For folks who are watching and listening, want to learn more about you or PSA, how can they reach out to you? Uh, you could find us on the uh, internet at psasystems.com, or you can uh, look look myself or the company up on LinkedIn. Awesome. Let's talk a little bit about what other things are driving growth in your industry. The lack of uh, employees. You know, right now there's 2.1 million uh, manufacturing jobs open. That's producing a, a lot of activity for us. Um, the need to be more efficient, faster in the distribution, um, and just in packaging is, is driving our business. The lack of available talent, huh? Yeah, you know, and everyone thinks, and you know, we've talked about it earlier, is um, everyone thinks robotics is actually gonna replace people. Um, we're not finding that. We're finding that we're replacing um, you know, people that are working in very difficult jobs, and those associates are being moved to other jobs. So morale in, the, morale in those facilities actually gets better because you're taking away some of the highest turnover jobs that no one wants to fulfill, and moving those staff into better jobs um, that are better, better for, for them. Yeah, you shared an interesting fun fact with me before we went on the air here today. Um, why don't you share that with the audience? I think folks may uh, really find it intriguing. Yeah, so I, I was doing some research. In the 1950 U.S. Census, to the, to the U.S. Census in 2021, I believe it was, there was only one job that is not listed in 72 years, and that was an elevator operator. So automation in 70 years has only eliminated one profession. And I'm sure that profession has been replaced by a lot more elevator programmers and other, other aspects of employment inside the elevator business. Uh, that was fascinating. I never would have even guessed the number of positions, let alone the positions. So. <laughs> yeah. yeah, fun fact. Yeah, we're, we're coming down to uh, the, the, uh, the short strokes here in this first segment. We have a couple of minutes left, but I uh, wanted to chat with you a little bit about kind of the process as you're talking to your customers. Uh, you've got a great ROI. Uh, wh what would be resistance? Why would people not automatically want to work with you? It seems like it would be a no-brainer. You know, a lot of companies are afraid of the automation. They're afraid of how it's going to be perceived by their staff. Uh, there's also a, a skills gap. Um, if we install a very sophisticated system, somebody inside that facility needs to operate that system. So they need training, upskilling of, of maintenance staff, um, E&I technicians, or just even manufacturing staff that are actually going to run the equipment. Um, that tends to be you know, some of the challenges in some of the facilities that we work in. Yeah, and I, I guess somewhere to your point, you mentioned that robotics does not replace people, but that's a, a myth and there's probably a, a prevalent fear among workers across yeah. the platform. You know, I, I think if, if you look at our business, you know, robots do not build custom automation systems. People build custom automation systems and people deploy these systems. So for us, you know, this is a very growing um, opportunity for engineers, fabricators um, to grow inside this industry because the industry is going to grow. You know, if you use the elevator operator philosophy, 70 years, we've eliminated one 
one job, one occupation, do it automation. I don't really see us eliminating too many jobs because of automation. I actually think we're, we're generating more opportunities for programmers, data analysis staff, um, and just maintenance staff mm -hmm. to run these systems. Yeah, I'm going to ask you an unfair question, and you don't have to have the answer at your fingertips, but just curious if you do know, how has robotics impacted the automotive industry? I mean, clearly it's been a positive con contributor, but any, any data that you might have on that? I don't have any direct data, but you know, through the 80s, um, when robotics started replacing a lot of line workers, you know the cost of cars have, you know theoretically came down. Uh, materials are up, but the amount of labor, physical labor, into a vehicle is a lot less. So our efficiencies are better. And one of the probably the biggest driver of automation in the auto industry is is um, quality. Yeah, paints better, manufacturing's better, everything is tighter. You know, taking out that human element of, you know, Dave, you're having a bad day today. Your podcast is no good. You know that that does affect everyone in their environment in, in, in their their life. You know, you wake up and you don't feel well. well you know, you're not going to perform well that day. Yeah, 100 percent. And uh, hopefully today's not that day for me. I'm feeling pretty so. good here, Mike, and I I'm thrilled so. to have you in the studio with me. And that's probably a good spot for us to take a quick commercial break. So for you watching and listening, you sit tight. We'll be right back on Behind the Numbers after this quick break. Shelter dogs aren't broken. They've simply experienced more life. If they were human, we would call them wise. They would be the ones with tales to tell and stories to write. The ones dealt a bad hand who responded with courage. Do not pity a shelter dog. Adopt one. Say we've got grit and we'll take it as a compliment. Because it's our uncommon drive, our spark within, that brings us together and sets us apart. We are temple made. And when others take shortcuts, when others take breaks, when others take the easy way, we take charge. Add us on social media to watch bloopers, behind the scenes footage, previews, and more. I work 13 hours a day, six days a week. So when I'm off the clock, I gotta get stuff done. So when I need a snack, I need something healthy, tasty, and easy to eat. Like wonderful pistachios without the shells. They're protein powered, delicious, and great on the go. And that's perfect for me. Thanks, Liz. A woman without a lot of time. Whether you're a girl. And welcome back to Behind the Numbers. I'm Dave Bookbinder, and today we're talking robotics and automation with Mike McHale. Uh, Mike, welcome back to the second round Thank here. Uh, during the commercial break, you shared a statistic with me. I thought it was fascinating, and I'm going to ask you to share it with the audience if you don't mind. Yeah, the Brookings Institute uh, th thinks by 2030, 75 million jobs will be eliminated by automation, but 133 million will be added due to that automation. So that just, you know, to me, tells you about the, the shift of the skill set of employees, you know, the AI, AI driven data analytics, you know, there'll be a lot of new oc occupations that come out of uh, the next de you know, decade. Yeah, and like you said in the first segment, there's a lot of positions that are being re replaced by automation, but a lot of those positions are ones where workers are being hurt um, and it's giving them potentially an opportunity to do different things and have the robots or the automation process take over those tasks that are, you know, unsafe. Um, or, yeah. or could put somebody in danger. Yes, yeah, you know, you're, you're helping out the employees, you're also helping out quality and throughput in the facility. So, you know, we can make more products at a cheaper cost. Um, and obviously now with inflation, you know, everyone knows, you know, that that's gonna help us out. Automation should, should be able to help some inflation over time. Yeah, um, I wanna shift gears a little bit and, and talk about you as a leader and, and your company. Uh, because you've said to me many times in our conversations, we're a people business. Yeah, you know, robots, like I mentioned earlier, um, robots don't build robots. Um, people build robots. 
and people build robot systems. So our business is heavily driven by our engineers, our designers, and our fabricators. Um, we couldn't deliver one system um, without the team. Yeah, and how did you fare during the pandemic? I think that that's kind of a unique story, if I recall correctly. Yeah, we did, we did pretty well. Um, we had, a, we had some slowdowns at the end of 2019, early 2020, kind of right at the beginning of the pandemic. But after that, we, we saw growth. Um, we had deployments. And, uh, you know, it didn't really impact our business all that much. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about culture. Um, a lot of the CEOs that I talk to who are building culture, the ones that are doing it right and successfully always say that it, they have to be intentional about it. It starts at the top. It starts with them. And only they can make sure that the culture is done right. What's your take on culture, and what's it like over at PSA? Yeah, you know, you know that, that's an interesting topic. Um, I think as I've, I've, as as the company has grown and we've uh, kind of advanced, we've realized that the staff is 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 way more important than I had ever thought, maybe in my twenties. So as I've grown, yeah. um, you know, it, it's it, it's not about it's not not about I or me; it's about the team, and that that holds true. So you know, right now we have a, a vision statement for the company. Um, we're doing um, training for all of our staff through Seven Habits and trying to get our team to become more collaborative, um, to be able to produce a higher quality product. You know, yeah. collaboration produces better things. And we're really striving to do that and really driving the business in that direction. Any initiatives that aren't secret sauce that you could share with the audience for them to get some advice and guidance on how they may increase collaboration? You know, I think it's, it's about having uncomfortable conversations. You know, it's, it's taking um, staff and sitting down and realizing that everyone has a voice at the table. And if everyone has a voice at the table, you're allowed, you're allowed to show your concerns about potential issues, and hopefully that grows the team um, in a much stronger way. Um, collaboration in our, in our industry is, is fabulous. We have 60, 60 engineers and a lot of fabricators, and everybody has great visions and ideas. And it's nice to put that group of intelligence together and come up with the best solution. And if one or two people do that in a vacuum, typically don't get the best solution. Yeah. Those uncomfortable conversations, what you're alluding to, underpinning that is you're creating an environment where it's a safe space. Yeah. Where people can feel confident in sharing thoughts, you know, for better or for worse. Yeah, listen, uh, not every idea is great. You know, some ideas, you know, are, are terrible. But yeah. it's nice to get those ideas out there because maybe there's a, a bit of that idea that actually has real merit and you take that little tidbit and you pull that tidbit out. Yeah. How have you gotten the quiet ones to speak up in the room? You know, I think it sort of happens naturally. Um, the, the staff wants to grow. They want to participate. If you want to be the quiet person in the back of the room, you can't participate. And that we're, we're, we're trying to help um, and bring out that participation because a lot of those ideas are great. You know, you are going to have bad ideas. I've had bad ideas as a business owner. I've made poor decisions. I think we all have. Uh, and I think the, you grow by that. Yeah, and I'm going to give you a chance to kind of, I'll call it humble brag for a second here. I know that you're not the kind of guy that likes to, to talk about yourself, but um, for folks who are watching this episode, uh, they're, they're looking at a cover of you on a magazine, and I also know that you recently won an award. Why don't you tell the audience a little bit about both of those? Yeah, we launched a new division um, last year in SMT, which is Surface Mount Technology. You know, we see a, a great opportunity in the U.S. Um, re-onshoring of board manufacturing, um, and obviously last week you saw the you know, Senate um, just funded um, a fairly large redevelopment in that industry. So we're using our engineering and fabrication skills to launch new products into the, the SMT space. And um, we've come up with some, some innovative products, uh, kind of thinking outside the box and using all our engineering resources. Um, so yeah, we, we were on the cover of SMT um, magazine and it's really to launch the products. We, we have another product we're launching September 1st, and then we'll have a, a third product that we launch in January. Yeah, th this is a humble guy sitting next to me, folks. He says we were featured on the cover. It's his picture that's up there, but I like the way yeah. he says it's we. I didn't, I didn't develop the product. Um, I didn't fabricate the product, and, and I didn't engineer the product. You know, we uh, collaborated with people in the space. We have a great marketing team that's pushing it. Um, we have a, a great um, inventor of the product, uh, Charlie Moncavage, you know, and they're the driver of that space. You know, I'm there to make sure the bills are paid, and 
you know, we're pushing in the right direction. Yeah, I'm sure when your team watches this, they're going to be pretty proud. Why don't you tell folks who are watching and listening how they can connect with you if they want to work with you or have a conversation? You could uh, find us at psasystems.com, or uh, you could look PSA Systems up on the uh, on LinkedIn, and also myself at Michael McHale on LinkedIn. Great, Mike. A lot of times, um, an interesting segment is uh, the discussion of your entrepreneurial journey. A lot of folks in the audience are entrepreneurs or have an entrepreneurial itch. How did you get started? What inspired you? You know, I think it was uh, reaching into, reaching out of the comfort zone of, of a paycheck every week. Um, that that kind of got me started. Um, I learned from some very innovative people. Um, I was on the development team for the Rebel Casino Atlantic City uh, back in, in 2007, and several of those people on that staff kind of... Uh, pushed me in this direction, and I, and I kept on growing it. You know, I think entrepreneurs, everyone, th everyone thinks you become an entrepreneur, you become rich, everything's success. Um, there's a lot of not rich and a lot of not success in the entrepreneurial journey. You know, some people right out of the gate hit it, and some people, you know, you, you spend 10, 15 years um, finding the right thing, and you just, you, you got to keep, keep fighting for that dream or fighting for that goal. Yeah, one of the themes I always hear from entrepreneurs is the the successes that came from failures. Any yeah. failures yeah. earlier in, in your journey that uh, are, are, are memorable? Probably too many to list. To be <laughs> you, Dave. I, I think, you know, you, you learn from your mistakes. You don't necessarily learn from your victories because those victories may have came, come very easily. So the victories that come easy, you don't, you don't see the uh, stress and the problems that led to that victory. You know, and, and I, I think there's, you know, you kind of think back to a, a saying, you, you know, the, the, the mountains ahead. You always see the mountains ahead, but you've got about the mountains behind. You know, and you climb that hill, and now you have to climb the next hill. And yep. And being an entrepreneur, you're always climbing a hill. And sometimes you have to look back and realize there was a, probably a lot of really bumpy hills behind you. Yep. A lot of uh, business owners that I talk to uh, tell me that it's lonely at the top, uh, that they feel that they have to know all the answers. and. Uh, they're they're working with coaches or they're listening to podcasts like this and, and they hear that you know it's okay to ask for advice it's okay to ask for help have you ever had that experience where you felt like you were kind of the the lonely guy in the corner yeah and I think I've learned you know I've learned uh, over the years that the bigger group that you have the more things you, ed you educate yourself about education is power right so reading is power I don't think I was a great reader I wasn't a great researcher younger in my career now I spend a lot more time with that. Um, I think it was, it, it could be sensed lonely, um, but now it's not for me because I have a great network around, I have great friends, we have a great team, a management team. You know, there, there's not a lot of loneliness anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think what, when you start becoming successful as an entrepreneur is when you step out of that comfort zone of I need to know everything. Um, I don't really, I don't know everything at PSA. It's impossible. You know, there's, there's 85 people making decisions every day. I can't possibly know all those decisions. Right. Um, so you have to be able to trust. You have to surround yourself with competent staff, and your life becomes easier. Yeah, and that's a, a real key lesson for a lot of entrepreneurs to recognize that you've got to surround yourself with good people. Yeah, and you, you, you can't surround yourself with uh, yes men. You know, if everyone, if, if not every idea comes out of my out of my mouth is fabulous. There has to be somebody across the table to say, Mike, that's a terrible idea. You shouldn't do that, and you can't do that. And I, and I have a network mm -hmm. um, of friends and entrepreneurs and business people that I go to and I, I contact when I have ideas. You go have a drink, have a dinner, sit down, and have those conversations. Yeah, and you, you talked about the uncomfortable conversation, so you've created an environment where somebody internally can push back on you. But are you doing anything in the hiring process to identify the folks that have those kinds of characteristics? Yeah, we're, we're trying to... Um, we're, we're, we're doing a better, uh, better job at interviewing and trying to understand, I mean, not necessarily the goals of what the company's looking for, but the goals of that employee. You know, a lot of times we find that the failures of our hires are, are, are mostly because our goals and their goals are not aligned. Um, so we're trying to understand the goals of the employee to make sure those goals match with our goals. And if they don't match, and, and we're two different, two different avenues, chances are that, that employee's not gonna work out. Um, so we're spending more time understanding the needs um, mm -hmm. rather than the skill sets. You know, when we interview someone, the skill sets are typically there. It's whether it's a fit in the group. 
uh, do they want to fit into a, a group environment or are they, they standalone individuals? Yeah. Mike, I want to spend a couple of minutes talking about leadership and what it means to you. We were talking in the green room before we came on set today about your, your travel schedule and you're a very visible leader in your organization, but what does leadership mean to you? Well, that's a, uh, that's a loaded question. I, I think leadership is, uh, you, you're there to support your, your staff and your employees, whether it's on a personal, personal issues, helping them with finance, helping them with retirement, you know, that's leadership. It, it's driving the business, but it's, it's leading a team or an employee to do better. You know, if, if we're not um, making our employees better, I don't think that uh, we're doing the right job. You know, for me, I think one of, the, one of the joys of being an owner or an entrepreneur is when your staff starts to buy new cars or buy a house or have kids or get married. That's showing, that's showing that they trust in what you're doing or what the company's doing because they have bills to pay. Um, and that, that means a lot. Yeah. You've got a lot to be proud of with the business you've created and the team that you've assembled. Is there anything in particular that you're proud of more so than anything else? I don't think so. You know, I think we've, we've grown quickly. Um, we have very little turnover in our staff. Um, and, you know, I think we're doing great products, great projects for uh, great companies. You know, that's the goal. Do, do great things. Yeah. If you've got low turnover, you must be doing something right that people want to stick around and work with you. Yeah. You know, I think... Um, we bring in a lot of interns. We hire a lot of uh, staff out of college. Um, so we probably have right now over 10 of our engineers started as interns and are now employees. You know, and, and their careers get to grow. Um, they get more education and you know, they become a, 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 much smarter, um, a much smarter and skilled person in the work environment. Yeah, I think that's fascinating. Mike, I can't thank you enough for joining us in studio today. This has been a great conversation. Thank you. Thanks, Dave. I appreciate it. It's our pleasure. And we've been talking today with Mike McHale, who's the CEO of PSA. Do check him out. Do visit their website. He's got a lot of good things going on. And again, my name is Dave Bookbinder, and I'm the one that my clients turn to when they want to know what their most important assets are worth. You can find me on LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter. Please do hit me up. I'm always happy to have a chat as well.